have um, Danny Swafford come and fill in for Richard McVeigh, Danny Meggs, and Randy Mongold. Please come forward to help us open our meeting. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious Father, thank you for today that we can celebrate in your name. Thank you, Lord, for the gathering of these friends and servant hearts. Thank you, Lord, for this community we serve. Thank you, Lord, for watching over each and every one of us in our daily activities and bless this food to nourish from our bodies and our bodies to that continued service. Things we ask in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. To the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Milestones for today. We have remember birthday. Reese, are you here? March the twelfth. Reese Brinkner. There he is. Uh, then spouse's birthday. Mark Cup's wife, Neri, uh, Steve Shaw's wife, Nancy, and the anniversaries, Kat and MC Phelps for six years, uh, Scott, uh, Maul, and Holly, 14 years, Tom and Lucy Horton for 27 years. Salud. Salud. Okay. If you brought a guest today, would you please stand and introduce your guest? I don't see it, Mike. Okay. Sun City, and I'm from the Columbia, Missouri Rotary Club. I'm Gene Davenport. For those of you that are new to this club, which means within the last three years, I'm an honorary member here, but I live in District 5790 up in the Dallas uh, Fort Worth area. It's always good to come back to this club and see the old faces and a lot of new faces. Okay, well welcome all of you. So glad that you guys are here. Uh, Dennis, did you want to make your announcement? If you've had any time to get on the website, if you've bothered to read your email, you know the message about Club Runner. This is called a, a phone. And on the phone, there's an app called Club Runner. And uh, I think I'll call somebody here. It's ringing back there at Marissa's table. This is easy stuff. Get Club Runner. Get Club Runner on your phone. The message is well displayed in the website. And it's the easiest way of dealing with all of the elements of this club. The people, the activities, go for it. Thank you, Dennis, our PR chairman there. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a ramp bill tomorrow, so I think if you would see Myra after the meeting today, 
She can give you information on that, but it's here in Georgetown. Hope you all can attend. Uh, David Messering, did you have anything today? <coughs> Nothing really uh, a major moment. Um, as you all know, on the first uh, first Friday of each month, I held a little uh, session to familiarize people with our Rotary Club and Rotary Clubs in general. Uh, last couple of times, the uh, attendance has been pretty low, uh, approaching zero. In fact, exacting zero. So <laughs> I will. I'm going to start prompting you to tell me if you want and need um, one of these familiarization sessions so that I don't end up sitting up here for an hour waiting for somebody to show up. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, okay. I think we are all aware that we have golf tournament coming up. Nathan has been over here at the table signing folks up and he'll be there the rest of the meeting today so get your team reserved and that's Friday April the 12th our lunch meeting will actually be at Cowan Creek Pavilion that day and so we'll keep reminding you of that so you go to the right place okay at this time I'd like to invite Jenny McClellan up to introduce our speaker for today Good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure today to bring a wonderful speaker. Now, in your program, it says that uh, Jared is going to be our speaker. He's the director of the Office of Emergency Management for Williamson County. However, uh, I'm going to ask you to keep his wife in your prayers because he had to be at the hospital with her today for an illness that I, I don't know any details. But um, in his place, is a wonderful, uh, his, his deputy, uh, director of Office of Emergency Management, Michael Shu. Just before I introduce Michael, I wanted to give you a little preface as to why I know these folks. I've had the privilege of working with them for uh, the last four years, ever since the uh, Memorial Day floods of 2015. Some, one of the hats that I wear in the community is as the chair of the local VOAD, or Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. And I served for the last four years as the Long-Term Recovery Committee chair from those floods. Well, in that process, I had the opportunity to meet with um, several of the people from OEM, and they have just been wonderful. And now we are collaborating on how we strengthen and grow our local VOAD um, in, in various ways. So uh, it's, it was very obvious to me as soon as it became my turn to provide a, a program who I wanted to bring on board here to share a little bit more about what emergency management does. By the way, a week ago last Tuesday, our long-term recovery committee finally made the very last report and closure of the long-term recovery um, with the county commissioners and the uh, judge Gravel declared it closed. Whew, that was long four years. A lot of people believe that once you stop hearing about a disaster in the news that everything is okay, but it does take years. So with that, let me introduce you to Michael Shu. Um, Michael is a 20-year Army veteran, and upon retirement, he worked as a transportation supervisor with Round Rock ISD for 18 months. He then moved to the Texas Division of the Emergency Management, or TDM, as we call it in disaster recovery, in the state and federal plans unit of the preparedness section. While there, he vis revisited the state's energy and biological annex and was uh, the project manager for 2017, <clears throat> Texas, <clears throat> excuse me, Texas hurricane full-scale exercise. He transitioned from TDM in June of 2017 to the Williamson County Office of Emergency Management as the emergency management specialist and was promoted in January of this year 
to deputy of the emergency management coordinator position. Please help me give a round of a warm welcome to Michael Shu. city of Georgetown residents so uh, you know just looking around we're in good hands here uh, and so again thank you very much and uh, I apologize for Jared uh, not being able to make it today but uh, yeah he's got a pretty serious family emergency going on so he asked me to come and of course I jumped at the chance for free food and get to plug our our agency that a lot of people don't know about so we'll go through a quick slide uh, demonstration spoke with Brad I only have a certain amount of time and um, he said it's more beneficial for a question and answers type deal too <clears throat> so you know this here this is just depicting the different jurisdictional programs you really can't see it um, the city of Georgetown Round Rock Hutto Taylor uh, have their own emergency managers. So for your, for the city of Georgetown, that's Raymond Mejia, if you've got a chance to meet him. If, if they don't have one designated by law, we are the emergency managers. So Weir, Thrall, Copeland, um, you know, all the other smaller cities or townships, whatever, in the county, that's what we're responsible for. <clears throat> This uh, just defines an emergency um, that, that we deal with, and it's hard to tell you exactly when we would show up. Um, for us, it, it depends. Uh, do you remember the Austin water outage we had back in October? We ran that for the county. Even though it was an Austin um, problem, right, and they did, provided a lot of the equipment and the water itself, we had around 50,000 residents of the county affected because North Austin does travel into uh, into the county proper. And also uh, Round Rock and Leander get their water from Austin. And so, and, and that's a, what we call a cascading effect because not only like the city of Leander get their water, their school gets their water. And this is October, we, we're going into the spring break cycle drive for the schools, um, but uh, anyone work in the school districts, you know, uh, that's very important to have those students there, you know, for multiple reasons. And so that quickly becomes our problem in my office. <clears throat> uh, disasters, this is what we, you can normally see us at. And anything, in, you know, in between, especially we work directly for Judge Gravel. I'm appointed, Jared Thomas is appointed by the judge. Um, and so when Judge Gravel says, yes, you will do this, yes, sir, and then we go take care of it. So um, these are some of the things, the biggest uh, and the top three priorities for our office in the county is the fire. So we're about to go into fire season here in April. The county burns and it burns a lot. Flood, uh, we're about to, end of March, we're out of kind of our flood season, even though it can pop up any time. And then we usually pick that back up in October. Um, does anyone know where it floods regularly here in the city of Georgetown? No? Pretty, I'm sorry? Yes, yeah, Smith Branch, uh, the Shady Rivers RV Park. That's one we constantly, if it's gonna rain, we go over there. The rain's coming, you need to leave. And then we come back about four hours after it's been raining and we're, and we're rescuing people out of the water. So that's, you know, we have a continual problem with some of that stuff. Uh, and then the other, our third big issue is hazmat, uh, hazardous materials. Just because of 
IH 35 north and southbound lanes. That is a that is a national level significant uh, or critical infrastructure. Uh, that's some of the terminology we use. But just the trap, the the road traffic on that, and what's going up and down that road. There's chemicals on there you can't even pronounce. Um, if one of those were ever let loose, that would be a really bad day for any, anyone near 35. So that's our, that's our third biggest thing. So it's fire, flood, and hazmat release. That's what we really worry about. <laughs> uh, we work under the Robert T. Stafford Act. Uh, this is one of the federal statutes that we work under. I'm not going to bore you with it. It's just, uh, it, it lays out how elected officials can do declaring disasters and then what uh, what those expectations are for that. Um, again, another one, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5, that's if you ever uh, want to self-punish yourself, download that thing, please read it. Uh, it is exactly what you think it would be. It's a lot of legalese. Any lawyers here? I don't know how you do it. Um, it takes me probably three or four weeks or three or four pages to get through that. But uh, that's, that's again, just laying out um, how we operate, what our authorities are. Uh, we use the NIM system, National, National Incident Management System. Uh, this was born um, after 9-11, you know, because if you saw, there was a lot of, um, our problem is what we have with what's called self-dispatching. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not that guilty of it. My boss, because he's not here, I will say yes, he's very guilty of it. Um, say, for example, there's a problem in San Marcos. We're going because we have what's called mutual aid with the other uh, counties within Central Texas. So if something happens and it floods in San Marcos, we'll go unasked and we're kind of expected. That's a self-dispatching. This was now magnifying that on a national scale with the September 11th attacks. They had people coming from California, and, and these are just people I want to help, right? <clears throat> well, the National Incident Management System was implemented after that to help stop that because you're, we have a, a saying, there's a disaster within the disaster. Usually that's the volunteers and donations management, and that's also just people showing up and wanting to help. Uh, I was in Rockport during Hurricane Harvey. Daily, we had hundreds of people from all over the nation come in. Can we help? At that point, you're, you're more of a hindrance to me, and I'm, not, and I'm not saying don't do it, but now I have to worry about your, your safety, making sure that you're okay, you don't hurt yourself or hurt others. <clears throat> so that's that disaster within the disaster we have in this NIMS program which we fully implemented, uh, and it works really well because it's, it's, uh, we're trying to stop some of that stuff. Oh, uh, that's, uh, what do you really, I really want to get, I only have a certain amount of time and I just, I really want to get to uh, the question and answers. So for the state of Texas, do you know who leads the country, the nation in uh, state declared and local declared? declared disasters it is us it's the state of texas it used to be california you know and we finally kicked them off the number one top perch there uh, harvey really helped a lot thank you <clears throat> but texas is the leading um and it's and it's now it's by millions we're talking millions i mean like three digit millions of dollars that for our disasters so uh, we've had this law around for a while. It's uh, Section 418 of the Texas Government Code, and that's where I get all of my authority um, to recommend to the judge. Ultimately, the judge will decide this, but I have the authority as a Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator to recommend evacuations, to recommend uh, oil water notices, etc. And the judge will implement it, and at the city level, that's Raymond and the um, city mayor. The chapter 418 gives us all of our authority to do different things. Uh, once again, it is appointed. We serve at the pleasure of the judge. Uh, and then we also have under the Texas Administrative Code uh, 37, uh, Rule 7-1 and 7-2. That's where we also get some of our other authorities for Homeland Security. So uh, <clears throat> we are actually, uh, you know, we're backed 
by state law, which is great. Uh, here, this graphic, this is just showing uh, the prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery uh, management cycle. So prevention mitigation, if you ever wondered why traffic's being disrupted, right? Why are they fixing this bridge? You know, uh, it could be my office is doing that. We're trying to prevent or mitigate a habitual flood zone. Or why are they cutting down all these trees, right? Well, we're, we're preventing a wildfire. <clears throat> then you have their preparedness. That's an ongoing action. Personal preparedness, having enough water, enough food. Uh, knowing where you're going to go if you do get an evacuation order. If you near, live anywhere near an urban uh, wildfire interface, so that's where the trees are kind of around your house, like a big woodland area, I would maybe start to think about those personal preparedness actions during fire season because you may get a, a notification through our office, we use reverse 911, that you have to leave. And then by law, if that's a judge's signed order, we, we tell you you have to leave, of course you don't. This is the state of Texas, you don't have to leave your property. But we've now given you that information and then you, you're basically turning, you're, you're assuming that liability. And that's a big deal for us, is the liability. Um, those are some of the preparedness actions. We also do a lot of training and exercise. Um, the big thing is exercising. <clears throat> we just completed a, a February, we did a a large-scale uh, hazardous materials exercise. We did it in Round Rock, but it was all the uh, law enforcement, uh, fire, EMS, within the cities and with the county. And it went, our exercise went all the way down the I-35 corridor down to San Marcos. So it was a big deal. We, we try and do that a lot. Response, that's the uh, coming in and plucking you out of your home type deal. Uh, big crash in I-35. It depends on how big it is. Some of them, um, I don't want to sound callous, but some things it, it's like, oh, that's a, you know, they can, they can handle that. But when it's methyl, ethyl, whatever, or something like that, we will get involved. But the majority of the time, we really don't. And then the recovery, which is, as Jeannie said, that's a multi-year process. Um, so FEMA has what's called a joint field office, and they're based in Austin. It's stood up for every disaster. And they've told us that there are people that haven't been born yet that will be able to work and retire in the joint field office that was established for Hurricane Harvey. That's how long these recovery projects go. Memorial Day floods, big scheme of things. It wasn't that big, but we just now closed it out in February of 2019. So four years you're looking at for something like that. So you can just imagine. Then again, that's our uh, life cycle. I kind of talked through all that. The mitigation, mitigation projects, those are huge for us. That's where we really make a lot of money. Uh, every dollar spent on mitigation is six dollars saved on response and recovery funds. So if we spend a hundred dollars, you know, using math on fixing the problem now, we can save six hundred dollars, you know, uh, in the long run. Right, and then you add a couple of zeros to it, and that's when it really is financially impactful. <clears throat> Again, I'm not gonna, uh, these are some of our planning levels. I'm not gonna bore you with that. Uh, we, we did do all that stuff. Uh, we have plans for any and everything that you could possibly probably think of. From large animals, so cattle in the county, to small animals, personal pets, to you name it, we probably have a plan and we probably implemented it at one point. The big thing is we just continue to, uh, we, these plans have a life cycle and we just continue to maintain them. Uh, training, yeah, that's a, a, a big deal. Uh, last year, over 350 first responders, 13 public officials, uh, and then this is some of, the, some of the training that we've gone over, active shooter, hazmat, flooding, wildfire, management of resources. So we try to do a lot of it. Um, responses, you know, this is some of the stuff that we've done. That was our more larger uh, responses. We supported our SWAT team um, during, the, there was a, a burglary. It was a very high profile, uh, high consequence trial, we supported them, uh, wildfires, again, in the county, and then um, 
like I deployed to Lano County when they were burning and went there and helped them. Flooding, you know, and that happened. I mean, just get ready for that. Winter weather, and then we had a, we had a helicopter crash. Everyone remember that a couple months ago in a cotton field? Um, that was pretty interesting. <clears throat> so we can go from talking here, my pager goes off, and I'm out the door, and I don't even know what I'm, what I'm going to be faced with. But it, that, that's what we do. Um, again, you have emergency notification. If you ever get woken up at night, we don't do the Amber Alerts. So please don't get upset with me about the Amber Alerts. That's a state deal. But you get the phone call at 3 in the morning. It's an automated voice. This is, a, this is an emergency message from Williamson County. You're, you're instructed to evacuate your uh, house or whatever. Now, yeah, I usually, I probably am the one that sent that. So you can, you know who to get upset with. <clears throat> Recovery, again, we talked about that. I really want to get to the Q&A. Um, th this is just um, discussing a local disaster. So you could have a city disaster declaration or you could have a county. Uh, this, and this is some of the reasons why, if you can't read it, extraordinary powers formally implement activate provisions of the emergency management plan, provide additional liability, excuse me, additional liability protection to the government, agencies and volunteers, and formally request assistance from the state and federal uh, agencies. So if that disaster declaration is, um, is requested and, then it, and it's signed and, it, and it's published, there's usually something really bad going on, you know, <clears throat> and that's why we do it. So it, I would say take it seriously if you do see those. Uh, there's some of the effects, curfews, the big one, we do that uh, because we, if I ask you to leave, I also have to protect your property. That's why a lot of people ask, why is there a curfew? Well, if we've evacuated a neighborhood or a city, usually the people that are there aren't, aren't residents and they're trying to take your stuff. Honestly, we see that a lot. It's, it's very surprising. And it, it's very surprising that you see people try to make a dollar off someone else's, you know, worst day in their life. And they're trying to, you know, they want your TV. I don't understand it. Human nature. Um, Commandeering of facilities, we've done that. We can come in and, and ask. We generally like to ask a couple times if we can use your facility equipment or materials. And then we do have the, again, from chapter 418, we have the ability to say, I now own that. Thank you. We'll get you a hand receipt. We're going to take care of it as best we can, but that's, um, we're able to commandeer stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, suspension of selected codes and ordinances. That's the biggest one, too. Um, you will we'll do that we'll, with our fire marshal office. We'll start going ahead and, uh, and suspend some of those things, especially building codes, short term, maybe to get it something habitable for some someone. Or uh, the biggest one is uh, occupancy codes. We'll suspend that because if we were to use this as a shelter, you know, whatever the fire marshal says, 50 people in here, we'll suspend that code to get 200 people into the to building. To, you know, take care of them. Yeah. When to call, this is really the biggest thing to say. <laughs> I, was speaking to, I was speaking to someone else, right? I, we, never, we, we hardly get these opportunities to meet with y'all. Usually you see me patch on the back. What do you do? I own this, this, and this. Great. I need you to come with me. I need the keys. What's the alarm code? All right, we never get these, I never get to speak to people beforehand um, because uh, we, we're, we're very uh, little known about us until it goes bad and then you, you know, uh, then you see us on the, on the TV and like, who is that guy? I didn't know we pay, even paid for that service, right? That's very true. Um, you may see us driving around. I have a silver Tahoe. If you've ever wondered why, if you see me pulling up and it's not lunch hour uh, to your residence, there might be a problem, you know. And then, uh, it, uh, I wouldn't say lock the door, but you ready. But I did want to get to, uh, we have got a couple minutes for question and answer. And that's what I really wanted to get to. Yes, ma'am. If we can, if we can go to that. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah.
Yes, sir. Yeah, that that work. 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 Probably right now. Wow. I know it's. Probably right now, one of the things most of us want to ask is about the gas problem in Williams. Are y'all involved in that? And if so, what are you doing on that one? Yeah, that's uh, so Raymond Mejia. Please call him with the Georgetown Fire Department. <laughs> <laughs> That is the good thing about this job. No, there is a, there is, it's a, it's a very serious, uh, well, I don't want to say serious because I don't want you to say that I'm saying that. There is a gas leak, you know, the, it's a city problem. I hate to be that way with you. Uh, I know Atmos Energy, is anyone affected by it right now in the room? I know they're doing a lot for them. Food vouchers, they're putting them up. They've been evacuating residents, but I do know if, um, you know, natural gas, if there's anything over a 0%, doesn't matter the point, they get a 0% reading around any business or house, they're moving those people out of there. So they've evacuated a lot of people, but it's, I think it's more to, let's really err on the side of caution than anything else. Yeah, as, uh, as something as enormous as Hurricane Harvey, um, how do you guys work with an organization like the National Guard? We had a colonel here a few months ago spoke about what they did during that, and I would imagine the two of you guys got to all get on the same page. So. Yeah, and, and we are, and so, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep it here in the city. So if, there, if we requested the National Guard for the city of Georgetown, and, I, and I'm Raymond Mejia and I request them, they're going to work for Ray, um, and they're going to do what he, you know, um, what he asks. Now, they do have certain laws that they can't do under... Uh, title, I think it's Title 10 or whatever the titling is, um, you know, but you use them for curfew enforcement, you know, security, um, but they, they would in effect work for, for our office. And so there's the Texas Military Department, um, who's the Texas National Guard and the Texas State Guard is underneath. And so they would get activated. You, you see them doing a lot of rescues, a lot of uh, water, food, you know, type, you know, setting up what we call points of distribution pods. So, answer your question, sir? Good. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm kind of curious, you mentioned the emergency telephone notification. Yes, sir. How well can you pinpoint that, such as a trailer park that may be flooding, or a neighborhood that's a smaller area that's yes, sir. broad based? Can you pinpoint who yes. you notify? We can, we can get so granular. So reverse notification system, we also use it. We're able, so we're able, if there's an active shooter in this building and he's barricaded here, I'm able to, to uh, draw on a line on a map and I can call all the cell phones around the building except for in here to say, hey, there's an active shooter, he's barricaded something. We need you to leave for your safety. So yes, I can go down. Uh, five, ten foot level and, and start picking uh, cell phones. Yes, sir. Thank you. You, you uh, talked about the training for your personnel and staff. I'm wondering about training for the public. Uh, I'm serving here at this church yes, on staff and a few years ago there was a shooting down in Southern Springs, I believe. Yes, sir. And immediately after that, you know, we went on height yes, alert sir. to get things in order, but yes, sir. is there a regularity to some training that we should be involved with? That is a great question. So March 20th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Howley Jester Annex will be a, um, a personal preparedness um, presentation and question and answer kind of like this that my office will be hosting. And there's also through the Williamson County EMS uh, Emergency Set Medical Services. It's a free class, Stop the Bleed. Have we heard of that? where you get taught you get taught basic CPR and then how to stop someone bleeding. It's a great course. It's free. Reach out to the Williamson County EMS. They would love to come. They, it's a, I think it's a 20 minute course. You could do it during your, uh, you know, a club meeting if you so want it. So there is, uh, there's all kinds of stuff out there. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if there's any uh, local proactive flood control measures that are being planned currently? Uh, yes, there is. <clears throat> and that's another great question. And so we're trying to model San Marcos. They have a, they have a flood, and, and I don't want to geek out on you, but you know, for me, like this is all the science and stuff behind it. But they, we're, we're trying to implement that countywide with this, the county will pay for it. 
this, and we want the cities, uh, other jurisdictions to join us. Uh, we're looking to put in weather stations because the county doesn't have that many, um, water pressure monitoring systems, and then an actual, not a barrier, but a flood warning uh, system. So it's gonna be a solar powered, uh, solar charged battery powered flashing light system that will be able to turn those on. And, and honestly, uh, County Road 973, if it's overcast like today, there's certain parts of it that's already part flooded. We know that, you know, I mean, just that's how it is. So we are trying to do that. Um, the biggest hurdle that we have is, is the financial obligation to that, you know, of course, just like everyone else. Um, but my, I, I can tell you, uh, my boss, he is working on a countywide uh, flood mitigation project. And we've also finished our countywide, just to let you know, we're very happy for it. We finished and had signed by our court, our countywide uh, wildfire protection program and also our countywide uh, flood protection program. So that, so we are, we're, we're trying our best to do this. Um, you know, and it's just simply turn around, don't drown with a lot of, a lot of these things that we see too. You know, we see it a lot. Yes, ma'am. Michael, uh, our VOAD and your Office of Emergency Management, we're talking a lot about things that we need to really work on in the future. Yes, would you please address, this is one of two questions, but would you please address the issue we talk about a lot, which is donations management, okay. the disaster within the disaster. Yes, ma'am. And the second, oh, the first, <clears throat> I have to be, I have to be very careful because it, you can't ever, you don't want to ever upset someone that wants to give you something, right? But let me give you an example. Remember the Bastrop, com Bastrop Complex fires that we had a couple years ago? Bastrop at Burn? Somehow, some way, a firefighter said, we don't have enough stuff to drink. I, and this happened. The next day, 53-foot van full of uh, Red Bull shows up to help them. Any, any first responders, firefighters, do you know what the worst thing is for a firefighter to dream, right? That's that, like Jeannie said, the disaster within the disaster. Because by state law, once you give that to me, I can only give that out for that disaster. That 53 foot long van, 18 wheeler, I couldn't take that and, and give that to the food bank. That is illegal for me to do. It's weird, I know, I can't do that. So when, you, when we start receiving these donations, the sweatpants that you don't want anymore, all of, I'm, all of your left shoes, right? It happens. The problem that I have as an emergency manager is by law, I cannot take that to the arch down in Austin. Who would benefit the most from it, right? You know, we've already recovered these people, and they're, in the county, there is still donations that have been given to us from the May, uh, the Memorial Day floods. We still have that. Because if you're uh, not a Memorial Day flood impact victim, I can't give it to you. It's that simple. So that is the disaster within the disaster. And Harvey, we burned so much new Haynes t-shirts in the bags. We burned them, burnt thousands of dollars of just that one item because we, it was so much. I'm uh, you know, getting the, money, money is yes, please, if you can donate money, and that's, mm. I won't use it. Thank you again, I appreciate it. practice of our club to ask our speakers to sign a book and then we donate it to Pearl Elementary. Okay. Okay. So if you would do that before you leave. Yes, we have. Thank you so much. Okay, are there any other announcements for the good of Rotary? All right, would you all please join me in the things we think, say, and do? First, this is the truth. Second, it's a fair talk and concern. Third, we'll build we'll 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 better we'll friendships. And fourth, we'll be beneficial talk and concern. We're adjourned.